So good morning, good afternoon, um, and good evening to all our viewers from around the world. Welcome to the Stanford Global Energy Dialogue. Over the last three and a half months, we have had seven unique and extraordinary dialogues with thought leaders in energy that covered a wide range of topics, from impacts of COVID-19 to energy access and climate change. The videos of these dialogues can be found at gef.stanford.edu. Today's dialogue is dedicated to the memory of Jim Mahoney, who was an executive and a champion of sustainability at Bank of America, and a close friend and partner of Stanford Energy for more than a decade. Let me introduce my co-host for this dialogue, Alicia Seiger, who is the Managing Director of the Sustainable Finance Initiative of the Precord Institute for Energy. Alicia will introduce our guest today. Over to you, Alicia. Uh, I have the honor of welcoming today's very special guest. Anne Finucane is Vice Chairman at Bank of America. She also serves as Chairman of the Board of Bank of America Europe. Anne is responsible for the strategic positioning of Bank of America and leads the company's environmental, social, and governance, sustainable finance, capital deployment, and public policy efforts. In recognition of her leadership, Anne has regularly been named to Forbes, Fortune, and American Bankers' Most Powerful Women's Lists. I'm also pleased to welcome Richard Kaufman, who will be engaging Anne in this dialogue. Richard is the chair of Generate Capital. Among his many significant contributions to energy and finance, Richard has served as New York State's first energy czar, overseeing the state's energy agencies, and as senior finance advisor in Secretary Chu's Department of Energy. In another life, Richard was a partner at Goldman Sachs. After the Anne and Richard dialogue, we will have a student asking questions. And finally, Arun and I will return to manage questions from the audience. But before we begin, our speakers wanted to gauge the level of optimism this audience has for the current global policy landscape. So our question is, how likely is it that the European Union will pull together on the ambition of their Green Deal? See where we are. Okay, hey, feeling somewhat optimistic here, somewhere between likely and somewhat likely. That's great. And then turning back to the US, our next question, what are the chances for major US climate action in the next five years? Okay, let's see where we're at. Still in the, in the relatively optimistic, uh, closer to, to, to 50%, maybe even more than 50%. All right, so now that we've taken the temperature of our audience, over to you, Richard. Thanks, Alicia. So, Anne, I understand uh, happy anniversary is in order for you. Yeah, thank you, 25 years at the bank. So I hope they're gonna send you some chocolates or some flowers. What do you get after 25 years at Bank of America? Another day's work. Well, no good deed goes unpunished, for sure. <laughs> So, so much to talk about, uh, so many cross currents of energy, certainly seen all the fires in the West, which are the latest examples of, of more concerns about climate change. Uh, there's been dramatic increases in ESG investing. The divestiture movement continues to gain steam and there are continued declines in the cost of wind, solar, and batteries. And, even oil and gas companies are talking about carbon emissions reductions and selling off uh, some of their oil and gas assets. But on the other hand, electric vehicle penetration is pretty low. We're well off target for emissions reductions to achieve under two degrees C. The United States has become an oil and gas global powerhouse and China has stepped up now again, its building of coal power plants. So, where do you think the needle is headed on energy transition, and where do you think we are at this moment? Well, thank you, Richard, and thanks everyone for having me, and thank you for making this in the memory of my dear friend, uh, Jim Mahoney, who really uh, began this process more than 15 years ago uh, when we signed on with Stanford and other universities and with other uh, like-minded companies to try to tackle the issue of um, greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, and what the business community could do about it. And the 
transition over that time has been enormous. Let me just speak a little bit about some of the sort of uh, touch points you uh, noted, Richard. So I'd say the first piece of good news is that the business community in general, particularly multinationals, see the, um, the issue of environment, climate change, uh, greenhouse uh, gas reduction protocols and the need for them as a growing concern and probably also a business opportunity. So in the, in, to be specific, in the banking industry, more and more companies, our clients, are coming to us and looking for help in um, dealing with uh, reduction in scope one and two and ultimately in scope three uh, in terms of uh, the greenhouse gas protocol. Why are they doing it? Because they're multinationals, they believe that the European deal, uh, Green Deal, will happen. Now, whether it will happen this year or next year is, is for anyone uh, to debate, but we do think it will happen. Once it happens, if you're a multinational company, you then have to look at how are you gonna deal with the landscape of your company? You're not going to uh, attend to something in Europe and then leave it for uh, the US to be different. So you start to make uh, change uh, in anticipation of that. I would also say, but because of the uh, Paris Agreement, a company like ours who signed on to the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015 and 2016 in implementation, in order to uh, make good on these promises, it takes us years to do it. So the fact that this administration may be less favorable to uh, legislation or regulation or research uh, and development in, in terms of um, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, the fact is that we had already begun it, and we and many others. So you see GM, Mary Barra, with just um, in an analyst meeting talking about their commitment and their progress um, on electronic vehicles, electric vehicles. You've seen the same for VW in, um, out of Germany. So what I mean to say is we see both business opportunities as well as commitments we made that it took or take a long time to uh, make happen, make possible. So I'm optimistic. Now what I am, uh, I think, concerned about like everybody else is that the pace is too slow uh, there's not an agreement globally. Uh, China is, uh, as you say, uh, developing more in the area of oil and gas. I do think if uh, the EU passes the EU Green Deal, uh, the US will, as I said, through multinationals, start to have a bigger movement. China will follow the US. I think that they have already done a fair amount in terms of R&D, uh, carbon capture. This is, they have looked at the technology. If they are not doing it itself, they're looking at the technology of carbon capture, the value of hydrogen, etc. But they, of course, they're not feeling um, the pressure that they might otherwise have if the EU had passed the Green Deal, if the US had either legislation, regulation, or even uh, investments out of the government to do more here. But I think this is all on the come, whether it is in the US four years from now, uh, because we keep, uh, because the Trump administration will prevail, or four months from now, if uh, the Biden administration is in place. All right, so Anne, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to drill down more on the, on the, on the uh, EU Green Deal, because maybe not everybody's familiar with it, and, you're you're proposing something that could really be a game changer, if if U.S. Uh, multinationals need to comply with European rules. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about 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 what the green EU, EU Green Deal would mean uh, and where it is. You said it could be a year or two until it gets an, enacted into law. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about the process too. Okay, well, the process is, um, if. I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on EU uh, legislative bodies, but the basic process is that uh, the, the, uh, the taxonomy has been uh, passed. So how to, what to call what has been passed. 
Uh, the EU Commission uh, has has made its uh, points. It's issued its papers. It has gone to the EU Parliament. The Parliament will vote sometime before the fourth quarter, I think. Of course, it could be delayed. It could be the first quarter of next year, but within the next 12 months. The member states then vote. The 27 member states then vote. Um, and there'll be some parlay between the two, Parliament and the member states, to come up with an agreement. But the end game will be that there is an agreement to get to net zero by 2050, and there'll be benchmarks along the way, some as aggressive as saying that they'll get halfway there by 2030. So just suspend disbelief and say they will do it by 2030, uh, and you'd have to get halfway there. Well, the amount of action that would have to take to get us to net zero by uh, halfway there by 2030 is, is pretty enormous. And um, I think that you will see both the carrot and the stick, meaning you will, the stick will be the legislation and the regulation that requires companies, entities to get there. And the carrot will be perhaps tax incentives or uh, tax credits or, or some sort of uh, mechanism to, to speed up the process. Now we had these kinds of uh, tax equity kind of uh, incentives that are just uh, sunsetting this year uh, out of the Obama administration, which by the way, were very attractive, meaning that there were tax incentives for companies to do energy efficiency uh, audits and to uh, begin to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So you can imagine that if this came out of the EU in uh, past in 2021, then you have nine years to get to 50% to net zero. That puts everyone on a pretty quick trajectory, uh, whether you're uh, a manufacturer, a service company, or an oil and gas company. So I'm curious, um, you know, I can understand, I, I know that there are active green parties in Europe, and I, I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the support of the business community for this, for the, for the Green Deal. Uh, there's been all, I was wondering whether, how much the business community or, or political leaders are thinking about this as a economic opportunity for the promise of, of new companies and new industries and how much of it is more uh, existing European companies that uh, think that they, they're looking at the tea leaves and want to develop a strong domestic market within Europe uh, for, uh, for their products and services that they, then, they can, then they can take internationally to give competitive advantage. Well, I think first, remember that in Europe, the issue of uh, climate, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, methane, et cetera, this isn't political in Europe. It's uniquely political in the US. So uh, the business community is not fighting it. The business community is simply trying to figure out how to do it. And uh, they need help, obviously, in doing it. As a financial institution, we see that as an opportunity because it'll need financing um, from everything from getting to an energy audit to their own activities, to uh, solar panels, wind, uh, et cetera, to, to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I would say the business community, and I get this from the International Business Council, the World Economic Forum, and even uh, some sort of study groups that come out of the UN with the business community. I would say the European business community sees it as inevitable. Uh, they, uh, many of them have already begun this process. They do need financing. They do need help. Um, I could get into where I think BP and Shell, who are committing to being net zero in 2050, which essentially says, they will be out of the fossil fuel business and they will have developed technologies in the renewable uh, carbon capture 
methane capture, et cetera, that will reduce and then get them to net zero. I mean, they will have to commit to this because they're European companies. Um, and I would add that despite the fact that the UK will have completed Brexit, let's assume, the UK has already pledged that they will essentially have a, a uh, like bill and like regulation in around the same time as the EU. So again, I would say we see this as not political in Europe. And then just to play that out, if you're a multinational, you would be looking at this as the, the first step. Also for the EU, which often doesn't lead um, in economic matters. You know, it's seen as uh, in, in aggregate, slow growth, uh, slow population, um, not on the cutting edge of, of uh, world matters. It, that, it changes for the EU. For the EU, it now means that they are on the cutting edge. They will set the agenda on climate and the rest will follow. And I, I think it's remarkable, but I also think it's true. And so you think this, is, this could be really enduring? because oh, there's yeah. broad consensus. Yes. I can't imagine that it isn't enduring. I think that people may miss their marks by 2030. I think that there will be um, delays along the way because technology, the investment in technology will be in some way um, uh, not, uh, not as fast as it needs to be, but I, I absolutely believe that it is inevitable. And I believe because it's inevitable, multinationals, particularly US multinationals, will move more quickly. And meanwhile, I think we see opportunities. We certainly see opportunities uh, in everything from hydrogen to capture to wind, solar. Uh, just you see this kind of activity. And I just, just as a, like a very basic thing, if you're a company that can get to, there are three scopes, this sort of greenhouse gas protocol that the World Resource Institute and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development have agreed to. There are these three scopes. One and two is essentially your own activity, what you do uh, as a carbon emitter. And it is addressing that. So you buy renewables, you reduce your water usage, you uh, use solar or wind in, instead of uh, traditional energy sources. So you, let's say you can get through all of that. You still probably need some sort of offset. If you need some sort of offset, you need to buy it out in the marketplace. Once you have to buy it out in the marketplace, what is available to buy? Right now it's mostly nonprofit. So it's you know, a nonprofit that's uh, reforesting uh, the Amazon or, or creating solar in villages or something that's in the nonprofit world, but th that will, that's too finite, it's too small. So there'll be a business community that is built up uh, on, on uh, this offset world. And I think that's a marketplace. So we see this already, this is happening before the European Green Deal has happened. So when you talk about additional offsets, you're talking about carbon sequestration, uh, taking suits from the air, what are you talking about there? What kind of technologies? Well, you name it. I mean, it will be, it won't be one thing because it will have to just be something that passes muster. So use of hydrogen, more in uh, EV, more in terms of uh, carbon capture. Uh, I mean, I, I, and part of it will be actually, I think, uh, aggregating smaller companies putting research behind it and getting uh, some sort of carbon pricing for that. So that also is, you know, that's a little uh, nascent right now, the, the whole issue of carbon pricing, but that will become uh, much more de rigueur. It will become something that I think people will accept. Okay, so maybe you could talk a little bit more about, about the role of, of banks. You've, you talked earlier about the uh, uh, companies coming to you about scope one, two, and three. So what's, what would, what, and so there's a, there's a whole variety of business uh, opportunities I can see for the bank, but in addition, what's your role in terms of compliance under, under the EU Green Deal? Well, whether it's the EU Green Deal or this greenhouse gas protocol, 
there are these three scopes, one, two, and three. Three is where uh, financial institutions have a heavier burden and maybe a bigger opportunity as well. The heavier burden is that we will then have to report out on our clients, their behavior, their, uh, their greenhouse gas uh, emissions, uh, their carbon footprint, et cetera. So if you're trying to get to net zero, uh, we are then responsible for their behavior as well. Once that happens, and um, that is we're beginning, we, we have within the next three years, we, our company will have picked one category, uh, let's just say real estate, and uh, start to try to dissect that. And in doing that, we'll then portend what we could do for other industries. But the point is, then we're responsible for any client's behavior as well. Well, as soon as you get into that, then you start thinking about who are you banking? Because if there's no movement in that category or that company, uh, eventually you're gonna be out of compliance. Now, initially with the EU, but as I say, I think that it is just common sense that um, we will eventually see US legislation and regulation. Once that happens, I think China follows. So the point is, we see both uh, the risk of banking a company that is just ignoring all of this, and we see the opportunity of those that aren't so that we can help underwrite new activity. Well, what you're describing are some pretty powerful uh, maybe even kind of, uh, at least for, for many of us, uh, not fully thought through uh, things that are really gonna move the needle. This, the combination of the, the role of banks in compliance and who you're gonna bank and who you're not, uh, what uh, multinational companies are gonna need to do to be in compliance and the, and the EU Green, Green Deal. So it's, and so, what what you're also saying is that is that um, is that the U.S. is really going to be maybe dragged into having legislation because the U.S. multinational companies and major financial institutions are going to be leading. I think that's the case. Uh, well, I think the EU is leading. I think the multinationals will come along because it's common sense. Many of them are, have already made movement. Uh, you have millennials who are a larger population than the baby boomers and have more heft and they expect this to be part of the equation. I mean, it's any number of factors, but these very basic things uh, are, are really important. And I do think the US will follow the EU. I think it will be a fast follow uh, with one administration and a slower follow with the other, but I think it's happening nonetheless. And then I think China, uh, which has invested in the technology and may not be using it, may come along more quickly as well, because they'll, this, uh, then you're creating a marketplace. And once you create a marketplace, as opposed to uh, we'll all abide by the rules, but rather that you're creating a marketplace um, at the same time, I see real activity. I don't know that every nation and every continent is going to be equal here. So I do think there will be laggards. So when you talk about a marketplace, what do you, what do you mean by a marketplace? Well, there's a, if you, if a marketplace, if you have to get to net zero, you have to, you name the company, you have to get to net zero, you have to figure out how you're doing it. So first you do the marketplace, you have uh, third parties that help you evaluate your uh, carbon footprint. You have companies that help you uh, install technology that will reduce your carbon footprint. You have companies that help you with the offset. I mean, there's just a marketplace here that doesn't really exist now. So you talked also about uh, oil and gas companies and, and they have these major uh, objectives that they're going to have to achieve. How likely is it uh, that some of the majors are going to be able to do that? Um, is uh, Equinor and Orsted, are they the, are they the uh, models or are they the exception to the rule that prove the rule? Well, I think they're, uh, 
I'm not sure I would use them as the models because they're state owned. Um, I think you're better off looking at models like BP and Shell who are not state owned and they're publicly traded. And uh, I think they're just a better indicator, uh, which is not to denigrate the others. It's just my own view is that if it's state owned, it's a little different. Um, well, first of all, BP and Shell, I think, are doing some very impressive things. I know you had Chad Holiday on, so you have a sense of that. But the amount of money that they're putting into their R&D, their uh, EV work, uh, carbon sequestration, it is, is uh, powerful. And I think that's what the indicator is. Are they saying they will get to net zero by 2050? Are they giving a blueprint? Are they investing in the R&D? Are they showing early signs? In both cases, they are doing that. I think there are other oil and gas companies that will simply wait for regulation. They're doing some things, but not as much as perhaps these two. Okay. So uh, let's, let's talk about uh, ESG. That's one of the areas that you're responsible for at, at Bank of America. Um, okay. What are the, thing, the things that we've been talking about? Uh, how does that change the ESG investing um, if multinational companies need to be in compliance? Does this mean more reporting? Certainly there's a lot of reporting now. Uh, does it mean more money flowing into ESG funds or, or does it mean something more than that? Uh, maybe a change in how mainstream investors value energy transition and climate risk, because arguably um, maybe we're in a carbon bubble when it comes to how most mainstream investors uh, evaluate uh, climate, climate risk. So I think we are uh, at a pivot point. ESG was a uh, nice to do, good to do, um, people did it for various reasons. There's enough research, first of all, now, let's just say what I would argue is maybe five years later, that those companies that have applied true ESG governance to their companies, and what I mean by that is they have begun on the journey and can, and can demonstrate it because they have published a TCFD report, or they are being evaluated by the alphabet soup of, of, uh, of uh, organizations and such that are, are looking at them, that they are demonstrating some development. But if you look at these companies now, they are generally less, uh, less likely to be bankrupt. They are in general, uh, trading at a high a multiple. They are uh, more appealing to their customers and to their employees. So we see real value in having strong ESG metrics, ESG behavior. Uh, the E is obvious. It's what we're talking about here. The S is the social contract with both the customer and your own employees. What is the minimum wage? How do you treat people in terms of maternity, paternity, L LGBTQ issues, uh, you name it. And then on governance is how well do you govern? What is What does your organization look like? And what do you look like in terms of diversity, both uh, in terms of gender and race? Those things uh, I think were just seen as being generally good to do, but now there are uh, companies, our own research department, uh, Merrill Lynch research. So this is apart from our company, it's you know, what, what we essentially sell to our, our clients, uh, indicates that those companies that have good ESG practices are just better companies, they perform better. That has been valuable in terms of making the argument. What's also valuable are millennials uh, because they are forcing an argument. And then in terms of where is the money coming from, the more that we see this as being real, the reality is that private capital does exist uh, to do more in the areas of environment and then generally on the sustainable development goals, whether we're talking about pension funds or insurance companies or wealth managers or banks, 
there are trillions of dollars available um, to invest. And if an asset management company or the investor before that, if a pension fund tells the asset manager that they will not invest, they do not want any investment in a fossil fuel company that is not making a turn, uh, that's going to make a huge difference in behavior. And we're beginning to see that. Now, I think we'll see more of it, but we're beginning to see it. Well, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to get at here, Anne, is, uh, is whether there's the, you talked about before, a marketplace developing for, for solutions, uh, which is really, hasn't really existed yet. So you're, or, or, you're, or certainly is gonna be widening um, a, away from just uh, purchases of renewable energy. And I'm wondering if there's an analogy here with on the investing side where with, with, with real, because you use the word real, with, with real changes going on and, and real commitments that have to be made that, uh, the, that investors will see real implications on companies uh, strategies and financial uh, consequences. And so that it begins to move the investing world out of, again, a lot of reporting and to uh, different kinds of uh, asset allocation and uh, valuation, not just in the ESG world, but amongst mainstream investors. Yeah, maybe I'm just not answering it adequately, but I already think that's beginning to happen. You've seen the sort of misses from Larry Fink at BlackRock, uh, shareholder votes, the proxy uh, statements, the uh, shareholder votes in large companies. There are many times uh, issues related to ESG more generally. So I wouldn't say it's specific to environment, but uh, the S and the G are, are certainly part of uh, the uh, proxy battles going on in the country, in this country, in the US. And I see, we just see a change. There's a lot of pressure on companies. First of all, there's the MSCIs, the Sustainalytics, the Dow Jones, um, Moody's, et cetera, evaluating you. That matters in terms of the valuation of your company and they're evaluating your ESG sort of standing. You've got the asset managers, BlackRock um, and others, who have said, we're, we're going to, those, those uh, investments that we control, we're going to evaluate you for your uh, ESG behavior, particularly around E. The missing link is the investors themselves. Right now, shareholder return is still the number one uh, indicator of success. When the pension funds start to really push for uh, certain behaviors, then game over. Uh, I think you will see a sea change and I think that's coming. I, I, guess, I guess we're agreeing because what you're describing as the scenario of, of Europe is that it will start changing uh, financial returns for companies. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so you, you mentioned that there's plenty of capital around. So can you talk a little bit more, that, more about that? You know, is there enough capital to, to, to fund the energy transition without wholesale redirection of capital from other sectors of the economy? Well, I think we might see wholesale redirection, but, but I guess what I would say is in the investing community, whether it's uh, investments from pension funds. I just was looking at some notes. There's $36 trillion in investable assets from pension funds, $18 trillion from insurance companies, $70 trillion from wealth managers, and $85 trillion from banks. If we just change the direction by 20 degrees, uh, that will make a big difference. If part of the framework is that the companies in which you're investing uh, must have a plan to get to net zero or to carbon neutrality in the, in, in the shorter term, that's going to make a difference. No one wants to be left behind there. People need, no company wants to be 
bereft of that kind of capital. So I think you'll see dramatic change. But the reason I think the EU is so important is something has to be done in black and white, and the EU is doing something in black and white. Now, the fact that the U.S. doesn't usually get led by the EU is sort of not, not, not to me, the big issue. The big issue is once it's set in motion, a multinational has to address, it's a very practical thing. They have to abide by what the rules are in Europe. You don't then do it with some, one thing for Europe and another thing for the U.S. and something else for South America. You just don't do it that way. You start looking at it in a wholesale basis because you recognize this is inevitable. It may be EU today and it may be the US five, 10 years from now, but it's going to happen. And companies think in these 10 year periods, we may be evaluated quarter by quarter, but we're still evaluated in terms of what is our long-term trajectory. So that's why I see this, this um, movement. The money is there, the capital is there, I think that you will see not just on the environment, but on these social issues um, as well, some changes. So that um, you know, technology has changed so much for companies. You need fewer people to do the activities that were in place 10 years ago. I'll use our bank as an example, but that also gives you an opportunity to pay your people better. So this is how you have, it's all iterative, but the EU is sort of, I think the crucible here, because they are the ones that will, once they create this law, it forces focus. Okay, so we're, we're running out of time. So I wanna, I wanna, uh, I want to uh, ask a couple more questions. So uh, you, I see the building blocks that you're laying out, the EU Green Deal, multinationals, the US following, China following, banks being involved in compliance, um, plenty of capital uh, uh, available. So is, where is the missing link in all this? Is, are, there new, are there new financial instruments that need to be developed? Or is there some other missing link that you can think of that you, keeps you up at night? Well, all of this is hard to do. The fact that it's logical doesn't mean that it's easy to do. It just means it's logical. Um, so it's very complicated to do. Uh, you have to have the will to do it. Uh, I think that the U.S., it will take some real effort. Uh, I think China will take some effort. And I think India and the countries in Africa will be slow followers because they don't have the resources, they don't have the uh, economic factors. You've got in India 200 million people that don't even have any form of electricity. Coal is much cheaper for them. So I see all sorts of problems. Uh, but I do think we have the capital. I do think that in terms of the financial world, we have come up with how we could structure uh, instruments, financial instruments to make this work. So I think the we will apply what we know. The sophisticated world of finance will apply what it knows and develop new products. So, uh, in the very basic things, uh, you know, 10 years ago, we started issuing uh, underwriting green bonds or the largest underwriter of green bonds. It's actually a very boring product, but it did create capacity. Then you issue green bonds, then you issue sustainability bonds. You can do more with that. Then you start thinking about uh, energy efficiency financing. You do energy audits. These are, these are not sexy products and services, but they're, uh, they're in place. They will grow. I do think we've got the, uh, the capacity, but I think it's gonna be slow going because the EU has to do their thing. I don't know how long, I mean, I hope it's in 2021, and then the U.S. needs to follow in some way. I just don't think it will follow necessarily by legislation and regulation. It may be uh, following because multinationals simply have to do it. Okay, and one, one last question, and since, since we're at a university, I'm gonna give you a, a fill, in the, fill in the answer question, all right? So, all right. The one thing that I learned 
in my 25, the most important thing I've learned in my 25 years at Bank of America is? To listen. So uh, none of what we have learned over the last decade in terms of energy, energy financing came from uh, within the bank. What happened is we listened to uh, universities like Stanford, uh, nonprofits, not-for-profits, uh, consortiums, uh, on the science, on, on the moral imperative, on the business opportunity, and we've applied that and tried to stand something up ourselves. We're a leader in uh, financing um, the transition. Uh, and if, but if we weren't listeners, and we weren't available for a change, nothing would have happened. So it's a pretty simple concept, but listening matters. That's great. Well, Anne, uh, thanks very much. Now I'm gonna turn things over to Alicia for the next part of the program. Thank you, Richard. Great, thank you, Richard. And Anne, I love your last comment about listening. That's a great lesson. Uh, so let me now introduce Stanford student, Victoria Wills. Victoria is currently pursuing a joint MBA and Master's in Science at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where she co-leads the GSB Energy Club. Victoria joined the GSB with a background in utility decision-making and risk management, and is passionate about designing better incentives for the energy transition. Take it away, Victoria. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Richard. And thanks, Anne, for joining us today. Um, many of the articles that I've read about you cite this fact that you consider yourself a former hippie and would have been surprised to learn that you ended up in banking and, and have now stayed with Bank of America for 25 years. So congratulations. Um, and I'm sure many of the students on the line would be curious, what drew you to banking originally and, and what's keeping you there up until today? Uh, yeah, thank I'm not sure I was a hippie. I think I was a, a reflection of my time when I was in school, which was the early 70s, and we were protesting a war and a president and uh, and uh, Earth Day, it's supporting Earth Day. Um, going to a bank, I'm sure I would be stunned that I was at a bank, but Banks make things happen. They can underwrite activity. They can finance the future. And uh, I was very taken by that two decades ago, uh, initially not having any idea that I would stay here. But the progress the company has made um, with uh, Jim Manny, Jim, I recruited Jim to come with me to the bank. Um, he had great insight because he came from the Federal Reserve. I felt that he understood the regulation and the legislation around banking, which I did not know. Uh, so together we came 25 years ago. In fact, I made him go two weeks before me. I finished a vacation. And uh, we were responsible for the public policy of the company. There was no such thing as ESG. People were talking about corporate responsibility. And to be, uh, responsible for the corporate responsibility of the company, uh, the direction of public policy, how we would market the company, how we would communicate the value of the company, how we would work on issues management. That was very interesting. I recognized then that a publicly traded company, uh, originally I was with a, a uh, fleet, which was then acquired by Bank of America, but using Bank of America as, as the proxy to uh, be able to represent a company with this kind of resources and with a leader in Brian Moynihan willing to uh, really consider the future of the planet, our employees, our clients, and recognize we had to make some changes uh, has been a privilege. So I think if I knew all of that when I was 19, I would be impressed. But on the face of it, it was, it's sort of a leap. <laughs> so given all of that, do you see the banking sector as a driver of positive change in the world, or do you see yourself more as a facilitator of what the market's demanding? I think that's been kind of a theme of your conversation so far with Richard. Well, I think we are a facilitator. 
but you're either a facilitator reluctantly or you're on your front foot with that. Hopefully we're on our front foot with that. We're willing. I, I want to make a point here, which is I think the financial uh, services industry in general recognizes the role it played in the recession. I don't think it was a single uh, reason for the issues, but it certainly played a heavy role there. And when you come out of something like that, you have to make a decision. What things are you going to change? In our case, we tried to change just about everything. Uh, we had a new CEO and he really was willing to uh, unpack the entire company and look at it and say, where are we headed? So he focused on eight lines of business. He talked about a strategy of responsible growth, meaning that we could only grow responsibly, which meant what kind of fees are you charging to your uh, customers? What kind of businesses are you in? What kind of employer are you? Uh, what kind of diversity do you have? Uh, and what is our role in what has become uh, sort of framed up as the sustainable development goals? What role could we play either because we'll philanthropically help or because we'll behave differently or because we can figure out how to finance the future of activity that will move the planet forward? Well, Bank of America has certainly been on the front foot with ESG. Um, and I know that Bank of America has directed upwards of $140 billion in financing for low carbon businesses um, as part of the Environmental Business Initiative. And now you just called this program not very sexy, but I was going to ask, how does it, including uh, billions of dollars in green bonds, impact the environment? I'm sorry, can you just repeat that last part of the question? Yeah, so how, how does the issuance of billions of dollars in green bonds impact the environment? Well, you're, the, um, when, you, when you issue a green bond, or in our case, underwrite so many green bonds, the way that a green, yeah, well, the way that a green bond uh, acts is kind of like a municipal bond and assuming none of you know what that is either. The, the, the idea is you're financing some activity uh, that will make a change. Here's a pretty prosaic one, but it, it's, it's illustrative. The city of Los Angeles uh, needed to, wanted to change its lighting from traditional uh, lighting to LED lighting. Well, that required the issuing and underwriting of a green bond, and indeed that happened. So what was the value? Well, obviously the greenhouse gas emission is reduced, but actually their energy bill was reduced too. If you can look at things in that practical a way, you can imagine what you can do with school buildings and lighting and water um, storage and sewage uh, all over the country. These things are not sexy, but they do make a big difference. And if there was, of course, uh, a will to do it more quickly, uh, that would be uh, that would be a game changer. So, at least in California, we are seeing the insurance market acknowledge the financial realities of the physical risks posed by climate change, including, of course, the increased frequency and magnitude of forest fires across the West that we're seeing now. So, along those lines, are there securities that Bank of America underwrites today that will not be financially sensible in the coming years? And I'm thinking of, for example, the 30-year mortgage in Sonoma or the, the municipal bond, the revenue bond, as you say, for a Miami airport? I think we're, first of all, we do have a risk framework we look at everything with. So uh, it wouldn't be specific to one thing or another, but all of those things have to be considered. Um, it also depends, it's a callable and not callable bond. So uh, you could, you could be you could have issued something and if it's if it's stays in place you have to uh keep with it i i think that we have to consider everything i i know people have asked us if uh we would write a 30 or 40 or 50 year bond for a fossil fuel company and in a case like that it really depends on who and what is the fossil fuel company if it is one that is uh leading in other words, it's really the R&D is, is clearly headed in the direction of recognizing the evolution of the industry. And they have a demonstrable R&D in uh, carbon capture, uh, methane reduction, et cetera, 
then that's a good bet. If they're, they've got their heads buried in the sand, well, that's less of a good bet and you would have to factor that in. So are you looking at a 30 year mortgage and an eroding beach? Sure. Um, but these are not um, framed up as big blocks at the moment because this is an emerging trend. And obviously uh, what we see in California or Portland, Oregon is just amazing. So mm -hmm. I think that the concern and the risk is escalating. There was actually a related question from an audience member. Um, do you see a world in which companies lacking a carbon neutral business plan might be subject to higher interest rates because of that increased business risk? And, and when do you see that happening, if so? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know if it's a higher interest. It might be the covenants are more difficult. There might be more restrictions. There might be less capital available. I, I do see that as a possibility. Uh, and maybe a reality, but the other kinds of elements that I mentioned earlier, I think have to be in place first. In other words, I don't think it will happen organically. I think it will happen because there will be um, either, either and uh, uh, legislation in one part of the world that is meaningful to the US and uh, enough pressure from both shareholders and investors. If pension funds start to make uh, enough noise, there'll be big changes. Mm -hmm. Beyond these quantifiable direct risks of climate change, do you see a moral imperative for banks to shift capital toward more sustainable businesses and, and away from carbon intensive industries, even when work with these sectors may remain profitable in the short term? Uh, that's a complicated answer, moral imperative. I think we're trying to do the right thing. We do have fossil fuel companies as part of our portfolio. It represents, I don't know, 5%, maybe less than 5% of the commercial enterprises of our company. So, uh, I mean, what we finance. And it's less today than it was five years ago. So we've reduced our um, fossil fuel portfolio. We're, we're really trying to be a little bit more positive and that is working with those companies and we are working with the companies on where they're going, where they're headed. I mean, they are, they're in a fight for their, their lives on the longer term. So these large companies and, and Richard was speaking of a couple that are uh, state owned, but on the, on those that are publicly traded, they do have shareholders who expect them to be able to generate a profit over the longer term, which means that they have a plan for the longer term, a short term plan to uh, just stick with the old themes isn't going to work for them in the longer term. So I think moral imperative is, uh, I'm not sure that that's the right word, but I would say that we feel that we have an obligation to the marketplace to help those companies evolve. Well, thank you so much. And I have one more question for you. Um, and this was also echoed in the chat already. For those on the line who are getting started in their careers and who are interested in sustainable finance, do you have any advice? And what do you see as the main opportunity areas going forward? Well, I think finance is a very good category because uh, the need, the magnitude of the need is, is uh, growing. I think it will require innovative thinking, uh, applying some uh, new developments, new research. So research and development is going to be big. Uh, I think that banking will be big. I think that biotech big. Um, so I, I see a lot of opportunity. This is a very real opportunity. This is really where the world is going. We will evolve, whether we go too slowly and we miss our opportunities in taking care of our children and our grandchildren. I hope that's not true. But I do believe that there is uh, a belief in the business community that we need to move more quickly and we need to coalesce 
around these issues. And I, I think that there are many companies that would uh, benefit from the very smart students that are at Stanford and other universities applying their thinking. So I encourage you to think about banks and Bank of America, but I think there are other companies that um, in the R&D world, in the, uh, in the uh, electronic vehicle uh, category, just there's so many categories that this will be applied in. Thank you so much, Anne. It was great to speak with you today. And I'm going to turn over to Arun and Alicia for a few more questions from the audience. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Anne, again, uh, thank you for joining us. And I mean, it was so encouraging to hear about your uh, realistic optimism uh, about what, what's going on and how this transition is going. Let me start by asking you, I, I know you talked about the uh, sort of the mid to long-term trends. We are in a financial crisis now with COVID-19 and um, it's across the world and it's uh, potentially, and it is, seems to be bigger than the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Can you tell us a little bit of the impact of that on, the, on climate uh, issues as well as the investments that you talked about earlier and how do we get out of it? There are lots of people out of jobs what is, what is your view on how to get out of this mess? I have a better view on the U.S. than I have globally. Um, our analysts tell us that we're looking at somewhere between four and a five percent five GDP negative for this year, and maybe three percent plus positive for 2021. So there's I wouldn't call it a V, but there's some bounce back in the U.S. Uh, there's no doubt that people are out of work. Um, it's largely in the service areas, you know, travel, restaurants. Uh, in terms of this category, that in terms of uh, in the environmental movement, I'm not sure that uh, as bad as the issues are, they're not directly related to investments in um, the environment. Whether there are fewer dollars to be invested, meaning uh, less private capital, less money out of asset managers or insurance companies, they nonetheless have to invest it somewhere. And if there is uh, the imperative, potentially a political will or legislation that forces us to accelerate more quickly, I simply think that you will see more investment in this area by, uh, by any one of those factors. So will there be less than there was in 2019? Yes, but uh, it's less than, it doesn't evaporate. The unemployment uh, trends are not directly related to this, this issue. In other words, um, where we see the greatest unemployment is is not in these sectors of, of banking and uh, technology. And um, this is a health crisis. This is not, I mean, it's a financial, it's a financial recession, which we are, seem to be uh, slowly uh, evolving out of, but it wasn't, it is not a fundamental financial crisis. It's a, a fundamental health crisis. So the dynamics are different. In other words, you have some uh, patient money on the side, you have a lot of cash that is uh, not at work right now. I think that uh, if we can make our way to a vaccine that I'm not in any way trying to be a Pollyanna here because I'm not, I think this is very rough sledding and a uh, whole sectors have been displaced. But, but even at a reduced level, a somewhat of a change in attitudes of investors would make a huge difference. Terrific. And so we're going to go back and forth between Alicia and me. We'll try okay. to cover about four or five questions that are coming through the um, Q&A, but we'll package it for you in teams. Okay. So over to you, Alicia. Thanks, Rune. Thanks, Anne. So we've been talking about the prospects for legislative action at the federal level and in the EU but a lot of progress can be made under existing authority. So just last week, I'm sure you saw a subcommittee of the Market Risk Advisory Committee of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission 
issued a groundbreaking report finding that climate change poses systemic risk to the US financial system. We called on the Federal Reserve and the Securities Exchange Commission, Exchange Commission to take steps to manage that risk under existing authority. How significant is that report in your opinion? And do you think the Fed and the SEC will take steps under existing authority in advance of legislative action? I don't know the answer to that. I think the current Fed and the current SEC may not. Uh, I think that there is a, a movement in the financial world to make change. Uh, for very practical reasons, we see what's coming. I think there is enormous pressure to, uh, to report out your uh, carbon emissions, whether it's the TCFD report or what have you. And uh, once one of us does it, so many of the large banks in the US have, have issued TCFD reports, and then they're evaluated for how robust are they. Uh, you're evaluated by many uh, entities, MCSI, MSCI, uh, Sustainalytics. Uh, this, I mean, there's a, there's a pattern. Then shareholders uh, create proposals and then they vote on them. There is real pressure on companies to do more. So I think that if you were talking about a moral imperative, that's kind of where it's coming from. It is uh, competitive tension it is market opportunity and there is a reality that this is coming at us and better that we take a lead rather than just react. I, I, I do think that if the Democrats take over the Senate and the House, you'll see legislation, but I don't know what happens with the administration because I don't know who's president and I don't know if the Senate will go uh, Democrat. I think if you see a stronger Republican push, you're going to have, I, do, I still think there's a big push on innovation and uh, investment in technology. It just is sort of a different ideology. Thanks, Anne. Over to you, Arun, next question. Yeah, so there are several questions on uncertainty and risk. And let me just try to package that in a way. So you mentioned about scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. Scope three is hard to quantify because it's many of the embedded carbon, et cetera, and there's work going on in trying to do that, but there's uncertainty out there. Mm -hmm. We just, at Stanford, we had a workshop recently on natural climate solutions, on how to use land use and reforestation in trying to remove carbon from the atmosphere, which could potentially be used for offsets. But there's quite a bit of uncertainty of how much carbon you actually um, sequester that way. Given, I, I'm trying to connect that to investments and finance because any uncertainty you have, uh, you know, changes the risk profile, changes the cost of capital. So I was wondering if you could tell us how to address this. What tools do you need? Can we reduce the risk? Can we reduce the cost of capital? The implications of that on the financial world. Well, that's quite a big question. <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that, and certainly not in the time allotted. Um, the first thing I would say is this is more than any other time in our history in the financial world. This requires collaboration. In other words, we need the scientific community, we need the research community, we need the environmental community, and you need the financial services industry to come together to rather than be cowered into something, to literally come together to try to figure something out. Uh, whether that's carbon pricing, whether that's how to evaluate uh, what could be an offset and will be agreed upon. One of the biggest problems we have right now is there are so many uh, representatives of environmental movements and who in the end is going to be the arbiter of reality is unclear. Uh, there's this body of work that's going on at the International Business Council, which our CEO, Brian Moynihan, chairs. And the International Business Council is essentially saying, uh, we are willing, and this is literally international, so every nation, uh, we are willing to, to be uh, evaluated 
but the problem is is it's all like a venn diagram i i meet the the criteria of one uh entity only to find out i'm missing two things on the next and so on and so on and you have staffs of people simply reporting out which I guess is okay, but it means those people are reporting out rather than productively thinking about what to do. If instead we could come up with a standard um, that, uh, these are my words, uh, not the um, IBC's words, but sort of like uh, lead status, where if you do this amount of things, you get this standing. And if you do that much more, it's silver and that much more gold and to platinum it at least would be a bellwether for uh, both the companies themselves and frankly, I think shareholders and the general public that, to be able to categorize where the companies are. The way it is now, um, if you fail on one, you've, you've been given a, you know, an award by another. And so uh, how would you even know? If you can't get that basic, then, then the sort of uh, math and science that you just laid out is really hard to determine. So I'm hoping that we can get to a point where um, we can get agreement and the four uh, big accounting firms are doing the metrics and they are uh, uh, working with, um, I think, you know, SASB, TCFD and others so that this is seen as being legit that we could come up with some sort of basic framework that at least if you could pass through that gauntlet, okay, you are uh, sort of in the green, if you will. If meanwhile, we can come up with in that same sort of continuum, what are legitimate offsets, then you have a marketplace. But I, 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 I you know, for fear of repeating myself, I don't have the answers to all of this. I can observe the problem and see where we're trying to make some progress. And one of the frustrations for companies, any company in any part of the world is having is, it's just too many metrics and too many different entities uh, evaluating you. And it's hard to know, well, is that the one that mattered? So what you're saying is just to follow up, simplified, categorize it like the kind of like the lead rating and then hopefully there'll be a race to the top um and and that would that would be that would be good for the whole ecosystem it would be right. good for the whole ecosystem and i would just say that just in something very specific like in the automotive world the fact that GM or VW was seen as not being uh, as on the front foot on electronic vehicles, they both say cost them. And now you see the kind of progress they're making. I, I think that we're sometimes losing track of, even as we're evaluating each other, we do see market opportunities and we try to move forward. Certainly for us, uh, the early days of underwriting green bonds opened up opportunities for do, to do energy audits, then to underwrite wind and solar, and to join with other financial institutions to de-risk a project we wouldn't have done otherwise. These are, this is the way business works. And if you multiply that, and then you have a collective will uh, of the public and your employees, that's what provides momentum. Over to you, Alicia. Thanks. Uh, so building on this discussion of the confusion of ESG metrics and uh, the alphabet soup of the Sustainable Accounting Standards Boards and the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, there's questions from the audience about what individuals can do with their personal savings uh, that align with sustainable finance and what lessons can be learned or best practices on the institutional investing side and the corporate uh, responsibility, uh, sustainable business side uh, that might be translated to personal finance decisions. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I think there is some uh, pretty straightforward opportunities. One, in your 401k or if you have a, a brokerage account, make sure that the, the mutual funds or the uh, ETFs or the direct 
equity that you're investing in is uh, abiding by principles that you think work and they all issue reports or if they haven't, you should look at that too. Um, from an instant, uh, I think from, a, from an employee perspective, asking your company what their practices are, they should have an ESG report. The ESG report should report out what they're doing uh, on the environment. It should indicate uh, those uh, metrics that are being established and the metrics that they're, they're going to follow. These are kind of basic things. It's what kind of company do you work for? Uh, what does your 401k investments look like? What are your, uh, or mutual funds or a brokerage account? And, uh, you know, vote with your money by, you, by only investing in those companies that you think are doing the right thing. I mean, if everybody did that, you can imagine what kind of difference it would make. Good, thanks. Um, there are quite a few questions on, and people have picked up on what you said about pension funds. And, and so there are quite a few questions on that. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate on some of the metrics the pensions funds may introduce for sustainability and just the responsible investments. I mean, what do you think they would actually do and when do you think that could happen? I think we're kind of in the process of it now. Pension funds, um, they're, they're representing teachers and firefighters and uh, municipal workers. So they, they must make good on uh, a shareholder return because it means that uh, it is your, literally your pension, your, your retirement. Uh, and therefore the idea isn't to give up uh, on, on performance by, by, uh, gesturing toward the environment. What they really need is both. I would tell you that uh, I am uh, part of a team that meets with our top in, uh, institutional investors, including big pension funds. And they do talk about this with us uh, and they are concerned. So I have seen a difference over the last five years in terms of attitude, in terms of issues, in terms of probing about the kind of company you are. So I think that's already beginning. For asset managers, the, the uh, idea is that they are presenting to the pension funds those kinds of uh, investments that do have some of the attributes that we're talking about, that have a good ESG record, et cetera. It's, in other words, it's not binary. I, uh, you, you must recognize that a pension fund's obligation is to its shareholders. And you have to recognize who the shareholder is. So you cannot trivialize these things. You have to really think about them and, and help the process. I wish that it was just a easy black and white. It isn't. Likewise, with the fossil fuel companies, you could just say, oh, I'm not gonna, we're not going to uh, finance them. But that's a mistake because half the country is, is uh, fueled by fossil fuels better that you're helping with the transition, better that you're helping them with how to finance toward the future, better that you are trying to come up with solutions that will be good for all of us in the long term rather than turning your back on them. So I think these things are, are difficult and they're complicated and it would be easy if they were just black and white, but they simply aren't. Thank you, and, and so over to you, Alicia. Yeah, great. I want to I want to build on that and turn to a question or a theme of questions that's coming up from the audience on what companies can do. So we've seen a, a spate of announcements recently. Uh, just this week, Google and Facebook have made announcements on uh, their uh, transition to low carbon energy, various innovations there. You've seen Microsoft and Amazon announce zillion dollar uh, climate innovation funds. What, in your view, do you think companies can do to best align uh, with uh, action, proactive action on, on climate and uh, rather than just simply reacting to, to laws and regulations? I think we're seeing it. I mean, I would take uh, other kinds of companies like Walmart and Target who are doing a lot in terms of um, their uh, facilities, in terms of uh, solar and um, retrofitting 
to uh, reduce their uh, usage of water and um, reduce their carbon footprint. So, I mean, we see it across the board with our clients. I wouldn't say every client, but we really do see it across the board. And it isn't uh, just the tech companies who are great, but they are, uh, and it isn't just companies. I think I gave you an example of the city of Los Angeles. It is finding vehicles for them to be able to make that transition. And uh, they can't make money where there isn't any. And to go back to Arun's point about when you have a, recession or a slowdown in the economy, that's not when you have extra cash to invest. So in many cases, this has to be a transition over time. They have to look to finance something that may in the end help them. So for the most part, when you do an energy audit of a company and you think about financing the future, the, uh, the solar, the wind, et cetera, buying renewables in the end will be less money but the transition may be uh, a difficult uh, hump to get over. So I would just say we are seeing it in all sorts of companies, ones that you wouldn't have expected, as I say, companies like Target and, and uh, Walmart. And uh, the more pressure employees put on their companies, the more transparencies company, transparent a company has to be about its behavior. The more reports it files, it tends to uh, change behavior. Good articulation of aligning incentives. And, and for the last question, I'm going to turn it over to you, Erwin. Yeah, so, um, so and uh, I, I really enjoyed your optimism. And I'm going to mm -hmm. leverage that. And this is about the future. Um, of, and, you know, the future is really about the kids in, who are not yet born who are in school, and some of them are in college, some of them in Stanford. And you talked about the millennials and how important they are. So step back for a moment and use your enthusiasm and your optimism and define, and if you were the energy czar, define a word that you like to see in 2040, 2030, 2040, 2050, when those kids who are in school and college will be at our age? Well, I'd like to see a world of net zero. Um, and I think it will happen. I, I, I actually don't want to be too optimistic. I think everything I said is possible, but you have to have the will and there has to be some point of leverage so I'm very hopeful about the European Green Deal because I think it's that point of leverage. If that doesn't happen, and I think it will, so it's a matter of to what extent it happens or whether it's delayed, uh, I, think it, I think that's the, the pivot point. And then it's a matter of how quickly everyone else gets on board. And for every year we don't, we delay uh, success. But I think it's inevitable. I think that whether it's the wildfires, um, that we're seeing or just the quality of air or uh, just I mean, any number of issues uh, that, that we will see this change. So for the students at Stanford and other universities, for a high school student, for somebody at a state college at a community college, for someone that never went to college and is in high school, I would just say this is, the opportunity is we are, this is a, uh, a revolution that's happening. And um, whether it's an evolution or a revolution, it's going to happen. We're going to get to a world where we're going to have uh, many more renewables and fewer fossil fuels. I think that fossil fuels will play a, a role in this uh, world for a good long time. But that is the importance of technology in terms of uh, capture and sequestration while we build the renewables. And those that want to get on board and help it happen, uh, hats off to you because it's, it's up to you. We, we can create a framework, but uh, you know, shame on us if we can't create some momentum for future generations to have success, both as citizens of the world and in business. Thank you, Anne. On that note, we'll, we'll bring this to an end. So, Anne, thank you again for joining us today. 
and thank you, Richard, uh, for also joining us. Uh, greatly appreciate uh, Alicia and Victoria to join us as well. And to all of you joining us from around the world, we hope you found today's Global Energy Dialogue informative and relevant during these unprecedented times. Please join us Wednesday, September 30th. It's not Tuesday, but Wednesday, September 30th, 8.30 to 10 a.m. on a dialogue with some of our own thought leaders at Stanford on the topic of natural climate solutions and its intersection with energy. We will conclude uh, our broadcast of today's program on behalf of the entire Stanford pre court Institute for Energy. We thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you again. Thank you so much.